So welcome to this live workshop on the connection between nutrition and the brain and the foods to eat and the foods to avoid for, uh, for your brain health and for your memory. So I want to really convince you about brain health and that what you eat really does actually matter for your brain. Great. Hi, right, Jackie. Thanks very much for, for joining. So we're kicking off now. Thank you very much for being here. So people often want to know about a kind of magic herb or supplement to take so my so my memory will get better. I'm not going to talk about that today because at the very end, I'd be, I'll be happy to answer some questions about supplements and, and nutrition and so on. But what I'm going to focus on really is the, the amazing benefits, the amazing brain benefits you can get from whole foods, from eating whole foods. And this notion of brain foods is a real thing. Foods that will actually benefit your brain and, of course, foods that sadly will do damage to your brain as well. But first of all, it's really important to just consider how the way, the way that our brain ages. So what we're showing here is how our brain, you know, how, how our brain ages across our, our lifespan. And brain aging, unfortunately, is inevitable. Uh, when we're younger, early on in life, our, our, grow, our brain grows more, new, more neurons than we actually need, you know, double the number of neurons we need in childhood and then we end up just keeping the ones that we use and specialize in so this is kind of massive rewiring during the teenage years that happens to the brain so during the teenage years all parts of the brain are in place but the whole thing the whole brain gets rewired from back to front from about puberty right the way through to our mid-20s so typically about kind of 14 15 years and we actually reach our peak brain capacity by about our mid to late 20s and this typically lasts about five years. And then, unfortunately, as we get older, the brain gradually starts to shrink and we lose brain cells and our thinking and our memory actually start to decline. So the brain really changes drastically as, as we get older. But what can we do about it? Can we actually do something with our diet to make a real difference to the way that our brain ages? I just want to show you here is how our cognitive functions are, so our memory and our thinking actually kind of change as we get older. So they kind of improve to a sort of a younger age and middle age. And as we get older, they start to decline. This, and this is what's shown here is really just your IQ, your intelligence level, broken down by fractions on different tasks. So and generally speaking, you can see here memory and other cognitive functions just tend to get kind of worse as we as we get older. As a population, we're living longer, which is a good thing. You know, we're an aging population and that's great. But unfortunately, our lifespan to how long we live is not completely matched to what we call our health span. So that's how long we're healthy across our, our life. And there's a dramatic increase, unfortunately, in the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see here that by the time you reach 65 and older, there's about one in 14 chance of developing dementia. And by the time we reach 80 or older, about one in five, and 90, about one in three, which is getting closer to about one in two now. And really, really sadly, these numbers are actually much worse for women than they are for men. And worldwide, there's about 55 million people living with dementia, and that's projected to, to triple to more than 150 million by 2015. And I just want to emphasize what's the changes that actually happened in the last few years, in the last 30 years or so. Since the sort of 1990s, there's been a 55 fold increase in age adjusted health, the health rate for Alzheimer's. That's a 55 fold increase. That's a huge number. So, what's going on? Some people might kind of claim that there's sort of toxins in the water or other factors in the environment that are contributing to this increase in dementia risk but the big picture the much bigger picture is is our lifestyle how we decide and how we choose to live our life and actually from now going forward we can choose to live our life for our brain and for our memory in fact for the rest of our our, our years no matter what age we're actually at now questions i'd like us to think about today is so is there a connection between the food we eat and the way that our brain 
ages. But the, the short answer is, yes, there is, as I wouldn't be giving this talk today to you. But So we know there is. But And it's inevitable that the brain will shrink and cognition, our thinking, our memory will get worse as we get older. But can we do something to slow that decline and sharpen our memory? Well, the science actually says, yes, we can. And the food, and we can with the and the food choices we make are a really big part of that. So how we can eat for our brain health and avoid foods that damage it and our memory? That's the other question we want to kind of think about. So when you choose food, what are you what are you thinking about? What are the choices that you drive you when you decide what food to eat? Buying food in a restaurant or in a supermarket. Share your thoughts with me in the chat if you want to about, you know, what what's your decision-making process? What's the driving force? Is it just the enjoyment of food or are you thinking about other things as well? So I really want you to sort of keep your brain in mind now when you make food choices. When we, at the end of the workshop, there's an opportunity for a question and answer session if people want to stick around and ask any of their own questions about nutrition and, and brain health. And I'll also share a simple meal plan with you to boost your brain health. And, make, and I will, just to say, I'm going to mention our Dementia Prevention Programme very briefly at the end, which is if you're interested in getting some extra help with your brain health, we're now enrolling students for our October co cohort on this 12-week live group coaching programme. Okay, so who am I and why in any way am I qualified to help and support you with your brain health and memory? Well, I'm a neuroscientist and I've been studying the brain, the inner workings of the brain for the best part of 20 years, really largely focusing on the sort of flexibility of the brain and how we can use that to help people with stroke and dementia. And more recently, I stepped away from my, my academic and research role to open a business, Ology, to really help and educate and support people to nurture and optimize their brain health through changes to, to lifestyle. And we do this through a bunch of mechanisms, but mainly our kind of brain health training, coaching, consultancy services, and our podcast as well for young people, adults, professionals, and, and organizations as well. So Jackie says, definitely love, I want a lovely taste, but I avoid processed and high sugar and salt food. Great. I eat a little red meat and love chicken and fish. Okay. And Roz, I'm a plant-based person and look at what additives are in foods that I buy. Okay. So really, really, really good to know. Thank you for that. So let's, what is the connection then between nutrition and brain aging? Well, research on our kind of population over kind of many years now, the science has sort of shown and brain health research really has kind of exploded over the last 20, 15, 20 years or so. We know that keeping your brain active, learning new things, exercising regularly we could argue about how much that should be how much you should be doing each day are really important good restorative sleep getting you kind of seven to eight hours a night general health things like eating the right kind of foods as we're talking about today cholesterol levels and blood pressure and so on and specifically hypertension is linked to dementia and cognitive decline and then kind of last but not least stress you know and really how you know managing stress which is a you know is everywhere in the modern world and how that changes the structure of our brain. So that's what we that's the, what may impact brain aging. Let's have a look at what you probably know a lot about already and what you might be working towards yourself as we get older and that's actually heart health. So heart disease and cardiovascular disease actually used to be the sort of leading cause of kind of mortality in the in the western world but actually last year for the first time that was still the case for men, but for the first time we saw actually saw that Alzheimer's and dementia have now taken that unenviable top spot of being the leading causes of death in women, which is really a really sad picture that's changing. So if I asked you what are the facts that matter for heart health, your answers, I'm sure, will be very similar to those for brain health. Exercise is good for your heart. Again, we could debate about how much quality sleep may prevent heart disease. Eating a healthy diet, not smoking, healthy blood pressure and cholesterol levels are really important as well. And specifically, you know, healthy blood glucose levels and preventing type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, which, which we're going to talk about in a second. Again, really important. And then there's stress there as well. 
So I'm trying to highlight here is there's, you know, there's really a lot of overlap, right, between brain health and heart health. And it's So eating for a healthy brain and for your memory really isn't that different to eating for a healthy heart. So it wouldn't surprise you, I'm sure, if it was that different. But we're going to go through the best and the worst foods for your brain health and memory. So there are some differences that we're going to pick out and highlight. Well, I just want you to keep in mind, it's, not, it's actually not that mysterious. And there's a lot of people out there, you know, you know who, are, who are often trying to sell supplements and so on, we're trying to make out the supplements and other compounds, you know, um, in much uh, are needed to improve your brain health and can make it kind of challenging. But it's actually not that complicated. And, you know, it's simple and you're very much in control of your brain health. There's so much, so much you can really do for your brain. And that's what I want to share with you today. Before we do, let's just point out a really important connection here, you know, that's kind of become prominent in the last few years. Really trying to sort of understand that when you eat the wrong, you know, the wrong kind of food, the things that can go drastically wrong with the brain. And we know that Alzheimer's and diabetes, diabetes have actually very similar characteristics. And in fact, that if you have type 2 diabetes, your risk for dementia is significantly increased. And there are some similarities between these conditions. So if you know, so if you're if you're sighing, I'm really sorry, perhaps because you've just been diagnosed with diabetes, um, or you know you have elevated blood glucose levels. But you, let's get on top of that. You can actually take charge of that situation. You really can do some things that will make a huge difference for yourself. And we know that there are millions in the UK and the US population that have type 2 diabetes millions worldwide and about 40 percent of people born today are expected to develop type 2 diabetes what does that tell us about alzheimer's and what we'll see in the future there's a massive increase in numbers coming down the road and we really are heading for an epidemic of alzheimer's if we don't change some things in our lifestyle style and diet i want to talk about first and foremost how our body and our brain processes or metabolizes carbohydrates, how we process them. I won't go too deep, but I want you to have a really good picture in your head. So when, when you choose foods, it really makes sense for what goes on inside of you. And here we have what we call kind of unrefined carbohydrates, sometimes called complex carbohydrates. So that's things like whole wheat, whole bread, whole wheat, bread, vegetables, broccoli, grains, and some fruit. Not all of them are here. There's a few examples here, but these are, you know, what we can, what we call unrefined carbohydrates. And then there's these, which are, let's just take a, a second. So we, lots of people might be thinking, hmm, tasty, right? Or we may have thought that in the past if we're eating healthily, but lots of people will still be attracted to this type of food. Lots of us like this stuff. We have pizza cakes, biscuits, crisps, chips. And these are what we call unrefined, uh, what we call refined carbohydrates, beg your pardon, or simple carbohydrates. And all, all these, all the food, these foods have refined sugar in them. But there's a big difference in the way that the body metabolizes them. So both types, refined and unrefined, have a kind of basic molecular unit. And that basic sugar unit is called glucose. And we're going to look at the way it gets inside the body and the way it gets inside when it doesn't actually work very well. The glucose is the basic unit of all carbohydrates, as I said, and it's the primary fuel source for all cells throughout our body. It gives, the, it gives them the energy that they need to function. But the brain cells, the, the cells inside our brain, which actually are the most energy hungry in the body, and the, the brain as an organ demands 20% of the body's total energy, even though the brain only actually weighs 5% of total body weight. So, so you've eaten some pizza, potatoes, sweets, cookies, whatever, and the glucose wants to get in to your cells. But it can't just walk in to those cells. To get glucose into a muscle cell, blood cell, or a brain cell, it needs insulin to unlock the door into the cell so the receptor, so glucose can do its job and give the cell the energy it needs to function. So if insulin and the, re and, and, and the receptor are working well together, the insulin unclogs, unlocks the receptor, 
and let the glucose do its job and walk into the cell and giving it the energy that it needs. So if we look at a kind of typical, so for people that have healthy blood sugar control, this is what's actually happening. If we look at kind of typical blood glucose responses, so if we look at time zero, so this is when you've eaten a meal and you see your blood glucose level below 100 in a fasted state, that's normal, and it rises in response to eating over time, over a few hours, and the insulin, insulin to letting the, as the insulin lets the glucose into the cell. So I hope that you know make, makes kind of sense just looking at that, like that particular plot. What's the story when insulin is unable to unlock the door to get inside the cell? So the receptor remains locked, and it's not sensitive to insulin. The insulin key can't unlock the door to the receptor. There's a variety of reasons that we can talk about diet lifestyle factors and genetics but with the receptor not responding the pancreas which is responsible for releasing insulin starts releasing more insulin to get the excess glucose into the cell meanwhile the cell itself is actually starving so, it so the brain then tells us to start eating more food and eventually with the pancreas under a lot of strain so i'm skipping a lot of steps here but eventually the glucose gets into the cell. We have a massively elevated blood sugar level. So there's our normal blood sugar response that I showed you earlier. And here's someone who is insulin resistant and who goes on to develop type 2 diabetes. They have a fasting blood sugar level, more gl glucose outside the cells. You can't get in. And, when, and when, when it gets in, it goes up, but it doesn't come down to where it should be. So you may be thinking, so what? Why does this matter? Well, that excess in glucose in your blood is going to cause some real problems. It's going to damage your blood vessels, and that's very, very serious. And that's why people with diabetes want to be in good blood sugar control. So this excess glucose leads to cardiovascular disease, and we know it causes inflammation. So we can think of that as sort of irritation and damage inside our blood vessels. And when these things are going on, blood vessels up in your brain, it damages the brain and this leads to dementia. And type two diabetes is very common. It's happening in teenagers, 20 year olds in midlife and beyond, but it's not inevitable. And there's lots that we can do about it. How is the food we eat and type two diabetes connected to Alzheimer's disease, memory problems and dementia? A lot of people with type 2 diabetes are actually overweight and obese, and they may have excess body fat, they may have high blood sugar levels, and they tend to have a lot of inflammation. That's that word again for sort of irritation, perhaps inside the inside the blood vessels. And they also may have this kind of complicated word, oxidative stress, which you can think of as the sort of decay you see in a banana when it's exposed to the air for long periods, or the rust of metal. This is gradually happening to the cells in your brain, impairing insulin signaling and, you know, and low level of an antioxidants and vitamin C. So let's, let's have a look at Alzheimer's disease on the other side here. And we have some characteristic changes to proteins, brain cell loss on the other end of the spectrum. But when we put the two conditions together, we really see a lot of similarities here. And we want to do something about cognitive decline, memory problems, and the development of dementia and Alzheimer's, we need to do something about type 2 diabetes. So someone in their 30s is showing elevated fasted blood sugar levels. What's that, what's that going to look like in 10 years or maybe even 20 years? And then in their 70s, that person may go on to develop dementia. Okay, so that's just I wanted to give the kind of context here to really talking about the foods. So you've got that picture in your head when we're thinking about our kind of food choices, because it's so important for our brain and memory. So what foods can we eat to keep our brain and memory in good shape and to keep Alzheimer's and dementia and type 2 diabetes at bay? So if I asked you what would be the best foods to eat for your heart, what would you say? Again, you know, let me know in the chat if you want to, but I think most people would say lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, lots of fish, and perhaps a little bit less meat. Well, the Mediterranean diet, which I've got on the screen here, has got a lot of attention as a healthy diet to eat. 
And the reason is that we have decades of research supporting it as a healthy diet. People who follow this diet, generally more plant-based food, more fish and more seafood. And on top of the pyramid here, we can see we have sweets and meats, and we're not going to be eating a lot of those. Then as you move down the pyramid, you consume things more often, like fruit, vegetables, olive oil, and nuts. And we have decades of science now showing that people and cultures who follow these diets have lower rates of heart disease, lower rates of diabetes, and you guessed it, lower rates of and lower rates of dementia and Alzheimer's disease as well. These are some of the foods from the Mediterranean diet shown on this slide. And also another healthy science-backed diet, and that's called the DASH diet. The, that stands for the, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So this diet is also largely plant-based. It includes some meat and lots of fruits and lots of veggies. But more recently, I guess in the last 10 to 12 years or so, researchers have pulled together the best elements of these two diets to create, to create what's called the MIND diet. And this is the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delays, bit of a mouthful, diet. This diet includes the best foods to eat, which, which correlate with a reduction in memory problems and dementia risk and other markers for, onsets of, for the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So for example, not all fruit is actually really beneficial for your brain health, except berries. And that's what the research shows, which is why berries are in this diet and other forms of fruit are not when we're eating for our brain and eating for our memory. So what I want to do is walk you through this diet so we can learn all about how which foods to eat, which foods to avoid. And as I said, I'll share a menu plan with you as well. And this is a diet that will lower your likelihood of developing insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. It's going to be good for your heart. It's going to be good for your brain and good for your memory. So what is the MIND diet? Well, to start off here, we're probably I would, you know, the, one of the most important things in this diet and diets generally, green leafy vegetables. are just packed with so many good nutrients for our brain and body and the recommendation of the mind diet is to eat at least six or more servings of these or green leafy vegetables or salad a week and then we have other types of colored vegetables so again at least six or more servings of, of these as well a week um <clears throat> And then we also, which I mentioned before, so we have berries as well that, again, so now we're, we're thinking about eating these at least twice a week. And it's important to say that fresh or frozen are just as good as each other. So in terms of the kind of nutrition and how we absorb it, and we'll discuss why they're beneficial for your brain in a minute. And then we have nuts. So five servings of nuts per week. So a serving, just to say, is really a sort of handful of thing, things, you know, a handful of like walnuts or almonds, almonds, cashew nuts, pistachio nuts, any kind of nut really, as long as they're in their natural form and not covered in sugar, sugar and chocolate. Then we have fish and seafood. We At least once a week is the recommendation of the MIND diet, but actually the science is really now showing ideally twice a week. And then we have olive oils to choose here um, you, to use for your cooking oil instead of margarine or perhaps butter or perhaps other types of oil. Um, and <clears throat> now whole grains as well. So things like whole oats, wild rice, brown rice, black rice, whole wheat. That's what we're talking about here. The fine, So the finely milled grains are not what we're after because they get into your bloodstream really quickly and diets that lead to quick release of glucose increases insulin resistance and we've seen what that does to you. So we don't want those in our diet. And then we have beans or legumes. So at least every other day, and this is one of the foods which lots of people don't actually include in their diet for various different reasons. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then we have poultry as well. Again, probably at least twice a week. Although, again, the science is slightly changing on this and there's some saturated fat in the skin. So ideally, 
skinless if you if you can and then one that um pe lots of people get excited about and that's a, a glass of wine a week a glass of red wine a week i mean you've got to love that right if you like your wine but i have to be honest the latest research actually suggests that if you can avoid alcohol completely for your brain health and for your memory that's the absolute optimum thing to to do but the mind diet says one glass per day so it's in here one per day that's not seven saved up for a Friday night. That's one per day, no more than one per day. And if you don't drink alcohol, you don't drink red wine, an alternative to wine is kind of grape juice or pomegranate juice, kind of those red colored juices um, as well. So, so, so you can see there's a large body of research out there now that's really showing that the mind diet is actually one of the best diets, perhaps the best diet for cognitive health and brain brain health. I just want to pick out a handful of examples of this research just to back up the, the the diet that I've shared with you there. So the original work actually showed that if you follow the mind diet for about two to five years, this reduces um, your memory problems and your risk of Alzheimer's disease by up to fifty three percent. So that's a big number. And even people who don't religiously stick to the diet, they still have a reduced risk of Alzheimer's by about thirty five percent. And actually, very recent research has shown that in a very large cohort of people who followed the MIND diet, they actually had much better cognition and much better memory. So the science is really there. And it's actually very recently, it's about to publish, I think next year, a randomized clinical trial underway right now that's comparing the relative effectiveness of these three diets that I've mentioned on Alzheimer's risk. Okay. So let's go through these foods and talk about why they are so good for your brain and memory. Um, so green leafy vegetables, you can eat them raw or steamed. So steamed actually means you get to absorb more of those compounds. So here we've got um, broccoli, bok choy, collard, greens, chard, spinach, spinach, many other kind of green leafy vegetables as well. And they, they're rich in antioxidants. What do we mean by antioxidants? Well, if you take three examples, so let's say we could say vitamin C, um, vitamin E, and beta carotene, they're three kind of classic examples of antioxidants. These, these antioxidants whose job is to protect different parts of our cells from damaging, from rusting, from decaying, from shriveling up and dying, they each have their own specific parts of the cell that they protect. From damage in our brain and in our blood vessels and we need to get these antioxidants from our diet and this is just three and there's actually hundreds in your diet so if you eat green leafy vegetables and berries you really are getting access you know to a huge array of these antioxidant compounds and you really can't just take a vitamin c pill or an omega-3 pill and think that you're good because you're definitely not. You have hundreds that you need and can get from eating whole foods. And pills and nutrition bars are really not adequate for that sort of purpose. So you also need to have another serving of colored vegetables, at least six per week. So all the color, co color compounds on these vegetables act as antioxidants. They have compounds in the skin and flesh to help them survive in the environment. And when, they eat them, when we eat them, we get some of these same compounds in our body. So berries, this is a fruit that's highly recommended on the diet and lots of really vibrant colors with these anthocyanins, they're called. It's a flavonoid that gives them this deep color. And it's an amazing antioxidant as well as um, other really beneficial properties as well. And we're looking at kind of a minimum of twice a week. Frozen, as I said before, is just as good as fresh, but dried loses some of the benefits of, of berries. So that's avoided if at all possible. And we have nuts, which are, these are wonderful. And there's a, their variety is amazing. There isn't really one best nut that contain essential antioxidants and fiber. And just something I wanted to mention there, which I don't have time to get into today, but fiber is also a really important property of another aspect of our brain health as i said i don't have time to talk about and that's the matters really for your gut health as well so we know gut health is intimately connected 
with your brain health and fiber is one of those things that really contributes to a kind of balance what we call microbiome that's the bacteria that live in your gut and having the right balance really helps for good gut health and also contributes uh, directly to to brain health as well i just want to mention that because i have time to talk about in this particular presentation but it's very very important so and we have fish as well and this is i would say very high up the list as a thing for your brain health cold water fish particularly like salmon trout herring sardines and seafood as well at least once a week ideally twice i would say now from the science and they are a vital source of omega-3 fats and vitamin b12 so omega-3s are actually a major component of the, of the brain itself why because it serves as a major component of cell membranes in the brain, the, 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 the kind of fatty thing that surrounds cells and it's part becomes part of brain cells themselves. So they improve brain function and they reduce the information as well in the brain that may have le led to cell, to cell death. So it's a really big, they're a really big factor in protecting memory and memory and against memory problems and dementia as well. So using olive oil, as your main form of fat, your main form of cooking oil to cook in. So why? Because it contains healthy and brain healthy fats and olives in there that, that cause less inflammation. And we also have whole grains. So these are a great supply of antioxidants as well, vitamin E and fiber. And we're always trying to look to buy grains from the supermarket or, or in, in the whole form if we can. So like brown rice or black rice, you know, or multigrain packages, you're looking at less processed as possible. Having oats in the morning as well, for example, is a, is a, is a great, great whole grain source. Then we have beans. So these need to be consumed five servings per week, sort of cold room temperature. And you can include them in soups, salads, burritos, Mexican food if you want. We're looking, we're looking at about a handful for one serving full of antioxidants and fiber as well so and then as i mentioned poultry twice a week a lean source of protein and vitamin b12 as well and just to remind you about this red wine that I actually that i mentioned before as well that one glass per day no more and if you don't enjoy the alcoholic drinks you've got grape juice pomegranate juices are great or non-sweetened um juices as well and you have these Color compounds like resveratrol in these, and these are great for your brain health. So, okay, so we talked about the foods to consume that are really good for your brain health and memory. But what about the foods to avoid, the foods which actually deplete brain resources and contribute to memory problems? So, turns out this is just as important as eating the right foods as well. What we're talking about here really are those kind of sugary drinks. A high intake of sugary drinks not only expands your waistline and boosts your risk of type 2 diabetes and heart disease as well, it also has a negative effect on your brain. So an excessive intake of sugary drinks will increase the odds of developing diabetes and the, the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And higher sugar, level, sugar levels in the blood can also increase the risk of dementia, as I said, even in people without diabetes. And the reason is the primary component of many sugary drinks is high fructose com syrups. So it's HCFS, which consists of 55% fruct fructose and 45% glucose. So a high intake of fructose can lead to obesity, high blood pressure, high blood fats, diabetes, and even arterial dysfunction. And these, these aspects of this type of metabolic syndrome may actually lead to an increase in the long-term risk of dementia as well. So studies have shown that a high fructose, high fructose intake can lead to insulin resistance in the brain as well as a reduction in brain function, memory, learning, and the formation of new brain cells as well. So some good alternatives to drink here if you are a sugary drink drinker th includes things like water, which is actually is the most brain healthy drink you can drink because the brain is made up of 80% water. It's a fantastic thing to drink if you can, a litre a day. Green tea and vegetable juice as well. They're great alternatives. Something else we kind of alluded to very early on in the talk 
in the in the workshop is refined carbohydrates so simple carbs so these include sugars and highly processed grains such as white flour and these types of carbs generally have a high glycemic index and this means your body digests them quickly and this causes a spike in your blood sugar and insulin levels so also when eaten in larger quantities these foods often have a um glycemic so, so foods that have a high glycemic index and high glycemic load have been found to actually impair your brain function so and research has shown that just a single meal with a high glycemic load can actually impair memory and that's in both children and adults as well so the effect on memory may be due to inflammation of this part of the brain involved in learning and memory that we call the hippocampus as well as responsiveness to hunger and fullness cues as well so so elderly people who consume most of their daily calories in the form of carbohydrates have actually been found to have almost double the risk of memory problems and dementia so what are some healthy low lower glycemic index carbs well things like foods like vegetables fruits legumes and whole grains are great kind of low gi alternatives another form of very unhealthy food for our brain is what we call trans fats and this is a type of unsaturated fat that can have a detrimental effect on brain health and trans fats occur naturally in animal products like meat and dairy and are not great for the brain but industrially produced trans fats so these are also known as hydrogenated hydrogenated vegetable oils are a kind of major problem for brain health so these artificial trans fats um, can be found in things like shortening margarine frosting snack foods ready-made cakes and pre-packaged biscuits as well and studies have found that when people consume higher amounts of trans fats they tend to have a hugely increased risk of alzheimer's disease poorer memory lower brain volume and cognitive decline but diets that are high in omega-3 fatty acids the ones we mentioned before have been found to help protect you against cognitive decline so you can increase the amount of omega-3 in your diet by eating foods like fatty fish like wild caught salmon chia seeds flax seeds and walnuts as well and moving on to you know one of the very bad thing that's out there in the, in the in the western diet that lots of us are kind of consuming and these are these highly processed foods that tend to be high in sugar added fats and salt as well so they include foods like crisps sweets instant noodles microwave popcorn shop bought sauces and ready-made meals and these foods are usually high in calories and low in other nutrients they're exactly the kind of foods that cause weight gain which can have a negative effect on your brain health and the nutrient composition of processed foods in the western diet can really also negatively impact the brain and contribute to the development of degenerative diseases as well so diet high in high in processed food leads to lower levels of sugar metabolism in the brain and a decrease in brain tissues then these are markers for alzheimer's disease so one of the ways processed foods may negatively impact the brain is by reducing the production that is important for for long-term memory of learning of, of, a, of a chemical in the brain that helps to grow new neurons and you can avoid these processed foods by eating kind of mostly fresh whole foods such as fruits vegetables nuts seeds legumes meat and fish as well final um, one on our list here of, of kind of foods to avoid is excessive consumption of alcohol that like i mentioned very early on in the workshop because have a really damaging effect on the brain and chronic alcohol use actually reduces the size of the brain it disrupts these things called neuro neuro neurotransmitters that they're the chemicals that cells use to communicate with each other and binge drinking can actually cause the brain to misinterpret what we call emotional cues so we reduce sensitivity to things like sad faces and increase sensitivity to kind of angry faces so these changes to our emotion recognition may be what causes the sort of alcohol related aggression which is actually driven by changes in your brain as well so another effect of alcohol is the disruption of sleep patterns which i've again mentioned earlier and drinking a large amount of alcohol before bed is associated with poor sleep quality which can really can lead 
to chronic sleep deprivation. That's a big risk factor, which I don't have time to talk about today, of Alzheimer's disease as well. So alternatives to drink are to alcohol, unsweetened cranberry juice, pomegranate juice, and, and grape juices as well. So we've gone through, we've gone through that quite quickly. So if you have any questions, please do post them in the chat. But just to reiterate what we've learned here in the workshop and what I've tried to cover and get across the kind of main messages are that eating a refined carbohydrate diet will eventually, unfortunately, starve brain cells of the fuel they need to function. And this, we now know, accelerates the brain aging process. The best foods to eat for your brain and memory are part of this, the mind diet that I've that I've described here. And that's a science that change to your lifestyle, nourishes the brain, enhances memory, and reduces the likelihood of developing dementia as well. And the foods to avoid to protect your brain and memory are really high in sugar, trans fats, highly processed foods, and too much alcohol, which can cause long-term damage to the brain and significantly impair memory. As I said, to help you get started, I want to give you just a simple mind diet plans to use. And you can, what I'm showing here is just Monday's plan, but if you want to get the full seven-day plan, you just use the QR code in the top right-hand corner there, or there's a link in the top of the chat as well that you can use. You can simply, it's, you can see it's really simple and tasty. So for a Monday here, we'd have Greek yogurt with raspberries topped with almonds for breakfast to start the week, a Mediterranean salad with an olive oil dressing, grilled chicken and whole wheat pita for lunch, followed by a burrito bell with brown rice, black beans, chicken salsa, and perhaps guacamole for dinner. So you can see, really simple, the mind diet is, is more of a kind of lifestyle change, more than just a diet, that you can just slowly adopt these changes and eat foods at any age, really at any age, to improve brain, brain health. So I hope that's all nice and clear for you. And before we jump in, so before we jump into taking questions um, in the Q&A session, I just want to briefly mention some other things that really are essential for your brain health. So we can think of there's actually five pillars of brain health that will help to optimize your brain and help you to reduce the risk of developing dementia. So we've covered in bold here, eat. So we've covered nutrition, eating, but there's also movement. So there's regular exercise in your daily routine, relaxation, so managing stress with mindful practices, time in nature and in supportive communities, sleep to get seven to eight hours of restorative sleep. That's really important because it helps to remove the toxins in your brain that can lead over years and decades to and contribute to um, memory problems and dementia later in life. And then finally, changing your brain by learning new things, challenging your brain, challenging yourself by learning new things. And, and, and we can think of these as what we call kind of multimodal complex activities. So you can see there's a huge amount to nurturing and maintaining a healthy brain, which is why we put together a live coaching program and course to help and support people who want to improve their brain health. And it's called the Dementia Prevention Program. So it's a 12-week live coaching program led and taught by myself to help you optimize your brain health and reduce your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. So whether it's for you or whether it's if you're working with other people to help them, the course is appropriate for, for both that, for coaches and for people wanting to work on this themselves. And we're currently enrolling students in our October intakes. So if you'd like to find out more about the program, just use the QR code at the top there or the link in the chat. And I'd love to help and support you and your brain health. So, okay. If you have some, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have about what we've discussed today or any other burning nutrition and brain health questions that you've asked. Let me just have a, have a look at the chat here. Okay, so we've got, thank you, Janice. Jenna, Janice, Jenna asking, how would you suggest helping teens transition to a healthier diet? So this is a great question because you, with any form of kind of change in diet or lifestyle, there's 
some definite kind of science back steps that you can de- you can take again which i'll be happy to kind of share in a more in more detail with you but something we cover on this on the dementia prevention program but specifically is you need to start you know the best way for any kind of any kind of um chain habit change particularly for teenagers as well is just to start incredibly small and when i say small i mean as small as you can possibly imagine so if it's trying to introduce some healthy aspect some healthy you know nutrient into their diet or healthy element into the diet just start really 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 small change one element in a plate of food so if it's you know if they're eating high, largely kind of processed food and you know un, unhealthy and refined carbs simple carbs and so on just gradually introduce you know of some vegetables like one vegetable onto the plate one at a time one meal and let them try and gradually eat that you know over the kind of week so so small that it's hardly kind of noticeable to them and in doing that as well talk to them about the benefits of a healthier diet for their body and for their brain in doing it to kind of reinforce whilst you're doing it but doing it so small not making a huge deal of it but just getting across the kind of the healthy benefits of it and doing it kind of step by step and we know and then when you do that it, and if and when they eat the food give them a reward you know really make a big deal about how great it has been they've been eating healthily for that particular meal so they associate you know eating healthy food with a pleasurable feeling and getting a reward from eating that from eating that food and then gradually go around in that cycle and start over time trying to introduce you know more and more food but slowly slowly so slowly 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 so that it's almost imperceptible and then over kind of weeks and months you know gradually you know adding those elements in but definitely not you know as as a habit change anyways one thing of what the science would help you to do is not trying to do too much too quickly so it's over a very slow period of time and really making a big deal of the giving them a reward and a pleasurable feeling after they've you know eaten the food and and also the other way around when they've avoided eating those unhealthy foods as well or rejected eating those unhealthy foods another thing to say as well habit change is much easier when things aren't accessible i mean food is just as addictive and sugar is just as addictive you know as you know as other things as alcohol and other drugs that are out there so out of sight out of mind incredibly important as well for trying to stop the house you know not or sorry not stop the house with those foods to make them accessible and keep them away, you know, as much as possible to reduce their kind of access to them. And again, you know, you can, you can, this can be a gradual process as you change the shopping, change the kind of elements of your weekly shop slowly, 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 but just patience and time and introducing those kind of healthy foods that I've talked about today, slowly, slowly. I hope that answers your, your question, Janet, uh, Janice, I beg your pardon. So, Roz Farrell, does our body naturally make its own insulin? So it does. That's right. So it's the pancreas that that does that. So and it does, and that's. But there's a limit. You know, it will just keep on making it in response to you know, the signal is the glucose that comes from around um, the glucose that's sitting in and around the cells. When it's when it's t- excess excessive glucose, insulin is released by the pancreas. And that's what is trying to clear it up and unlock those cells to let the glucose in. So it's yeah, it's produced naturally by the pancreas. Thank you for that. So, Roz, I also understand that olive oil should only be used for dressing and not used for cooking, as it loses some of its nutrients if heated. So that's a thank you, Roz. That's also a great question. So it's true, but it's actually high heat that what is what we're talking about. So. If 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 you cook any olive oil and, and lots of these nutrients at high heat, that's true with some other foods as well. They lose a lot of their the way the way you absorb them in your body. You, they lose a lot of those nutritious properties. So you don't want to cook at very high heat. So when you are using olive oil, you can use you know kind of low heat cooking and use them naturally in salads. But it can be you know you still get a lot of the you don't get as many benefits, but it's more beneficial to use olive oil and cooking than say vegetable oil or you know other forms of oil or butter or margarine because it's healthier for you not as beneficial than having it 
you know, as you say, uncooked or not a high heat, but you still get some of those nutrients and it's much better than cooking with other forms of fat. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. I hope that was useful. Um, any questions at all about that you might think about afterwards? Happy, just please do post them and I, and I will respond to them. Um, if you've signed up via the email, then I'll make the recording available for you to, to download and watch afterwards. And I'll send that you'll receive the link over the email that you signed up with probably tomorrow at the earliest, I would have thought. So thanks very much for coming along. Thanks, thanks Roz. My pleasure for the presentation. I hope it was, thank you, Janice. I hope it was useful and helpful. And um, I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Take care and bye-bye.